we are, we are looking at uh, direction uh, over the next four weeks. And um, we're, we're taking the next four weeks from one particular scripture. So I just want to read it to you. It's just one verse that we, we are devoting to the next four weeks. And it says this. It's from Zechariah 10, verse 4. It says, from Judah will come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was young in the Baptist church, um, uh, we, uh, we used to have youth meetings. And one, the, one of the meetings we used to have as youth was object meetings. And uh, uh, the, the idea was you had to bring an object and speak on a verse or speak something from God on it. So I remember, I was only a young boy, I remember one, one boy came, brought a safety pin and spoke on Isaiah, behold, I am undone. That's, uh, that was the sort of thing. But over the next four weeks, we're going to take one object a week. So we're going to take, um, today, we're going to take the cornerstone. I, I'm, I'm afraid it was a bit too big to bring a brick with me, but um, um, the next week, we're going to talk on a tent peg. The next week, a battle bow. And then the next week, ruler, every ruler. So, um, uh, so uh, yeah, well, I'll probably bring a ruler with me as well. So, um, so that's what we're going to speak on. Um, but today, we're going to speak on uh, the, the cornerstone. When we talk about from Judah, Judah was the most unsavory character in Jacob's sons. He was the one that sold Joseph into Egypt. He was, uh, his two boys were killed by God because of their wickedness. He was an immoral man. He was lacking integrity. Um, who would think anything would come out of Judah? But when you look at the Lion of Judah, wonderful people came from Judah. It's amazing. We discover all sorts of people came from Judah, but it culminated eventually out of this unsavory man. Christ came from Judah. It's exciting, isn't it? No matter what you've done, God can do exciting things through you. But th that's what happened. So when it says from Judah, when Zechariah said from Judah, he was speaking prophetically of Christ. He was saying Christ will come. And, and what we're looking at today is Christ will come as a cornerstone. And uh, so that we get some idea of what the cornerstone is. So, do, you, do you know, it's, it's mentioned all through Scripture, the cornerstone, many times. Jesus quoted it himself. But I want to just read from 1 Peter 2. This is what the, the Apostle Peter wrote. He says, as you, this is 1 Peter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that causes them to fall. The context of, of um, this scripture uh, is, is simply this. Um, God sent a living stone to the people in Jerusalem, to the Jews. He sent this living stone. That was the context of it. It's the context of God building something. That's what he wants to build as, as well here, isn't it? Now, this stone was rejected 
It was speaking of the Jews that rejected that stone. They wouldn't have it. We don't want it. It was a perfect living stone, but they reject it. So it speaks. It's speaking of the cross. When Jesus rejected, it was the cross. And that's what I really want to speak about. You cannot separate Christ from the cross. They are synonymous. If we are if we are Christ-centered, we're cross-centered. We're totally captured by the cross. They are both together. Now we are we are as a church embarking on a wonderful journey over this next year. And and we are seeking to implement what God has said to us prophetically. And as Simon said, one of the things that he told us to do was saturate ourselves in Christ this year. That's a glorious thing to do, isn't it? But you cannot saturate yourself in Christ without saturating yourself in the cross. They are, they are not divided. They are one. So I want to talk a little bit so that we, you know, to understand and see Christ, you have to see the cross. You have to see the cross to understand what the Christ is about. Now, this, this stone was strategic to the building of his church. It was utterly, it, 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 was, it, it is often described the capstone or the cornerstone, but it is the crucial part of what Christ is building. Um, it was a stone that was fundamental in the foundations the whole of the building depended upon the cornerstone. And it is a key for us. We've got to understand that the cross is the key for what he is building here. It is the key to forgiveness, cleansing, victory, winning the lost, deliverance, peace, spiritual rule, resurrection power, Faith and miracles. In fact, anything you mention depends on the cross. Without the cross, our message is just good ethics and principles. If, if we don't preach the cross, we're just, we're just preaching good things to do. The cross changes our message powerfully. Without the cross... Our lives are just about self-effort and self-achievement. Without the cross, the gospel may be good news, but it lacks total power. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? If we preach and want to preach to the lost, we must preach the cross. Because that's where the power is. Are you with me? The stone was strategic for the building. It is, it is crucial for us. Uh, listen, I am speaking. Uh, this is personal. Um, God has spoken to me very freshly about this. That the cross is to be strategic in my life. And it's to be strategic in your life. There was a famous preacher. Um, you've, heard, you've probably heard him. Martin Lloyd-Jones. One of the great preachers. And I want, just want to read you this too. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the greatest preachers of recent years, once confided to his several friends that a fundamental change took place in his outlook and preaching in 1929. He had, of course, emphasized from the beginning of his ministry the indispensable necessity of the new birth. But after preaching one night in South Wales the minister challenged him that the cross and the work of Christ appeared to have little place in his preaching. On his return home, he gave himself to study, declining both lunch and tea and causing his wife such anxiety that she telephoned her brother to see whether a doctor should be called. But when he later emerged, he claimed to have found the real heart of the gospel and the key 
to the inner meaning of the Christian faith. So the content of his preaching changed, and with that, its impact. The cross is to touch our lives like that. Once it touches our lives, it would touch everything. And then it says this, it says this, to those who believe in this stone, this stone is precious. Let me say, how precious is the cross to you? Is it just a religious thing? Or has the cross of Jesus Christ changed you and impacted you and become personal? That's the thing. As I, as I looked at this, I, I've asked God, God, is the cross personal to me? Is it real to me? Paul was enthralled by the cross. In fact, everything he ever spoke about was about, had to come down to the cross. Let me read you this. This is 1 Corinthians 1. It says this. For the message of the cross is foolish. Oh, no, I'll go back. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolish, Ness, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. It says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Uh, and I just, I just asked myself, um, if, if, if everything involved around Paul was the cross, how can it become precious to me? How can the cross touch my life? And, and I, there was two things. I, I just want to uh, show you two things that, that God really spoke to me. And I trust will speak to you. One is this. Sometimes you only see sin... In the light of other people's eyes. Now, I'll tell you an experience I had. Um, I, we were talking to some friends ages ago. Um, our family is Gavin and Stacy fans. We love Gavin and Stacy. And uh, I was eulogizing about Gavin and Stacy to us, friends, and, and they said, Oh, we'd like to watch it. So I said, Oh, we'll watch the first episode. We'll watch the first episode. Now, if you've watched Gavin and Stacy, the first episode, he's terrible. It's terrible. And we started watching it. And then suddenly, I don't know if you've done this with films or anything, and you're watching with another Christian, and you suddenly realize what's coming up. <laughs> and the first episode of Gavin and Stacey is terrible. And, and I was, oh, my heart was going. And, and the thing was, we'd watched it as a family. It'd been okay. But now when you're watching it with somebody else, you suddenly realize what's coming up. Uh, and uh, uh, we, I, I, we had to get through it anyway, so I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I, d I didn't realize. I forgot about that. <laughs> it was terrible. But sometimes we, 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 we see sin when we see it with God's eyes. But when have you seen sin from God's eyes? You see, sometimes we think God sees sin like we do. Oh, it's okay. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's okay. God will forgive me. God will forgive me. Um, there's, there's a quote that I, 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 I've written down here. It says, um, come here. Uh, no, I, I haven't got the quote. It's, it's, it's simply this, that sometimes we, we, we haven't seen sin in the same way that God has. And, and, and sometimes it is a complete shock when we see. Because let me tell you this. God hates sin. God hates sin. He, he, his whole character he has a continuous hatred and antagonism towards sin. It revolts him. In Revelation 3, it says it causes him to vomit. He, that's his attitude to sin. 
And sometimes we, 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 we don't see that. But once we see God's attitude to sin, then you see the meaning of the cross. Then you see how God views sin. And, and l- listen, folks, we preach about God's love, which is totally true. But it's when we preach about the cross, it highlights sin and the need for God to set people free. So one of the things is this. Once you see the cross, you see how God views sin. The second thing is this. And, and this, really, this really touched and changed my life. Is when you see your responsibility to, to Christ being on the cross. John Stott said this, which I'm, this, this quote has lived within my heart. It says this, before we begin to see the cross as something done for us, leading us to faith and worship, we have to see it as something done by us, leading us to repentance. We have to see something done by us leading us to repentance. Martin Luther said, we, we carried the nails in our pocket. We carried the nails in our pocket. Sometimes when we see it's that personal, the cross is that personal. You know when Peter preached at Pentecost at Acts 2, he said this, but this is one of the keys when, when the people were cut to the heart. He said, you crucified him. You did Did they crucify him? No, the Romans did that. But he was speaking personally. You crucified. And uh, there there is a poem I I just want to read because these things have just touched my heart. I hope I'm communicating it. There's a guy called John Newton. You, You know John Newton? He was the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. He was a slave trader who got incredibly saved. And he wrote this this poem, which I, I just want to read to you because it, it just touches my heart. And I hope I can communicate this. So this is the poem. In the evil long, I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw the one hanging there place his eyes on me as near his cross I stood shall never till my latest breath can I forget that look it seemed to charge me with his death but not a word he spoke my conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there Alas, I know not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I died that thou mayst live. Thus, while his death my sin displays in all its blackest blackest vein, such is the mystery of grace, it seals my pardon too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled, that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. Isn't that incredible? I, I, I say this because the cross is personal. It isn't just, oh, God forgives me. The cross is personal. My sin put him there. And I'm so grateful. I, I stand here and say to you, if it wasn't for the cross and Christ's grace towards me, I would have been got rid of years ago. He could have cast me aside. And I would have had no argument. I had no argument. But praise God, through the cross and his mercy, he saved me. 
It says this, a stone that causes men to stumble and fall. To those who believe, the stone is precious. The cross is precious. But for those who do not believe, it causes men to fall and stumble. How does this stone of the cross do that? Because it cuts across worthiness. It cuts across self-achievement. It cuts across self-effort and self-righteousness. It confronts sin and demands repentance. Uh, I, I have to say, they're not comfortable words today. In our world, they're not comfortable words. Sin and repentance, they're not comfortable to say. I realize that some of this message is not comfortable preaching. It's not comfortable. But the cross and the need for repentance changes lives. When we speak it honestly and faithfully and let it touch our lives personally, it causes us to be freed. I tell you, the more I see what Christ has done for me, the more I realize it is my freedom. It is my freedom. I need not be afraid of the message of the cross because it causes me. Uh, listen, whenever there is revival, whenever you see a move of God, the first part of it is repentance. People see the work of Christ and it changes them radically. And I believe God wants to do that amongst us. As we go through this year, and as we immerse ourselves in the wonder of Jesus, let the cross touch our lives and cause our message and our lives to be totally changed. You see, Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. He, he preached it. He said, I'm not ashamed of it. Neither should we be. Peter was not ashamed of it. Our message is wonder and glorious and precious and living. Let me just say that to finish, I, I, I started the, the, the whole thing of talking about something beautiful coming out of the unexpected. When you look at the cross, when you look at the cross, it's not pleasant to look at. Several years ago, I, I watched the film um, that Mel Gibson, uh, what was it called? The Passion of Christ. Um, of course, the Greek word for passion is suffering. It's, it's actually the suffering of Christ. It, it was a film I would never want to watch again. Um, it, it, I didn't like it, to be honest. Um, and I, so I didn't enjoy looking and seeing it. I, I, I still, the, 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 to look at the cross is not easy for me. But let me say this. Out of this, something beautiful comes. And if you let the cross touch your life, and during this year, as you immerse yourself in the revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done for you, something beautiful will come out of your life. And I tell you, something beautiful will come out of this church. For it won't be just words that sets people free. It won't be just words that bring miracles and faith. It will be as we gaze on the cross of Jesus Christ and let it touch your lives forever. That's from Judah, the cornerstone. It's a precious, precious stone that will change your life if you embrace it. Can we just pray? Lord, we, we just come to you and just thank you. Thank you for the magnificence of what you have done. We thank you 
for the precious life of Jesus. But even more, we thank you for that death that caused us to find you. And it has caused us to know complete freedom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for coming. Write this on our heart and use these stuttering words to change our lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen.